Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my, oh, no, not that. Oh, that's helpful. Okay. So, hello to everyone. Um, my name is Becky Anderson, and I work at Macmillan Learning with, uh, am I still presenting? Yes. Um, I work at Macmillan Learning, and I'm very excited. We have a lot of people who have signed up today. So we are going to get started. So this webinar is connecting with students to improve student learning. We have Dr. Michael Palakis from the University of Indianapolis with us today. Uh, Dr. Palakis was born in Greece and immigrated to the United States in 1992. He then promptly received his doctorate from the University of Indianapolis in 2002 and has been teaching at the University of Indianapolis since 2005. He teaches both at the undergraduate and graduate level and has a vibrant sense of humor, so I will not read the rest of the biography he gave me, which is mostly fibs. Um, and then we also have Marcy Bachman. Marcy is the executive director of Learning Science and Insights at Macmillan. She is responsible for supporting the development of educational programs and tools based on evidence-based practices identifying best implementation practices, and executing studies to evaluate program impact. Through the research of herself and her team, she has partnered with hundreds of institutions on research studies to better understand the needs of instructors and students, to ensure that the educational programs at Macmillan are developed to address those needs, and to test the impact of programs on student and instructor outcomes. We are very excited to have both of them. Um, the way this is going to work is everyone who is not um, myself and Marcy and Dr. Palakis is uh, on mute. So you should be able to, however, ask questions. So you can see here on my screen, you can ask questions. What we will do is we will be answering those questions after they are done talking. Um, but feel free to type in the questions as you go along as things occur to you. Um, and if for some reason you're not seeing the webinar, you click on that little blue flowery thing in the bottom of your tray. Um, so one thing I just wanted to mention, um, Dr. Palakis is gonna start by talking a little bit about the surveys that he has been using. And I just wanna explain a little bit what they are. So these are surveys that are assignments um, that we have in Achieve right now. He's gonna go over the content of these surveys and talk to you about what his students have said and then Marcy's going to go over um, the overall results of these but basically these are things to help students master their own learning so I just wanted to give a little explanation there okay let us see I'm going to make Michael the presenter Okay, do you see the option now to present? Yes, show my screen. Oh, yep. You guys can see the PowerPoint? We can. Awesome. Well, again, I mean, thank you, everybody. I mean, finally, I have to talk about something and it doesn't have to do about COVID and how do you pronounce all the different variants? Thank you, Greek alphabet. One time in my life, I don't have to explain my accent. So. Again, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Michael Koulakis. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Indianapolis. I teach both undergraduate and graduate courses. I also supervise dissertations and my research lab consists of doctoral students and we focus on issues of diversity and multiculturalism. I was lucky enough um, to actually test drive, achieve now for the last three semesters. So for this presentation, I want to specifically talk about the goal setting and the reflection surveys. So as I said, I have been using Achieve as a beta tester for three semesters now. Um, the way that I have set up my course, um, I have been using, I have been assigning five to six Achieve activities each week. And I have assigned, I want to say, if I remember correctly, four uh, surveys to monitor how are my students doing throughout the semester. So as part of the presentation, I'm going to also show you some of the data that I have received up to this point and what do I think is coming up 
next. Just to give you some uh, background about my class in, in the university. Um, so I'm teaching a face-to-face -face slash hybrid course. I have around 45 students and my class actually takes place on Mondays and Wednesdays, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Now, one of the things that the university has told all of us um, the last couple of years, and especially after COVID, is to pay special extra attention um, in each, for issues for retention and connecting with our students. Now, you know and I know this is also driven by the demographic cliff, but especially has affected significantly, and is going to affect significantly the Midwest where I'm currently located. So we pay more attention to issues of retention. And I think one of the things that I have liked about Achieve is that it gives me the opportunity to connect with my students on a personal level. <clears throat> now, as I said earlier, I have five or six activities each week. I have not assigned a midterm and I have not assigned um, a final exam. The way that I use Achieve is as a way for my students to apply the concepts that we have talked about in class. So they have the time to apply the concepts, check the video activities, and see how everything works from a psych perspective. Now, this is an actual screenshot from the survey itself. So this is what the students see when they're ready to take the survey. This is one of the first images that they see. The instructions are very clear. And what I want them actually to do is to develop a mindset of what are their goals for the class? What do they want to get from the class? How would they know that they understand the material and also that they can grow themselves as students? Now, and I say all of these things, and of course, I, th I take into consideration the context of COVID. I don't know how COVID has affected them, okay? I don't know how COVID influenced their high school experience. So for me, by assigning the surveys, the data give me a better understanding about who they are as people, and also they're informing my own instructional strategy and the way that I plan my course. Now, I'm a psychologist by training. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. So for me, is that it's imperative I don't want to make assumptions. I don't want to make assumptions about who my students are, where they're coming from. I just want to meet them where they are. Now, the survey itself, and it's short and sweet. We're talking about 10 questions, and the best part about it, they cannot fail them. They cannot fail them in any way. So let's dive into the data just to give you an idea about what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> what I have done is that this is an actual screenshot from the report itself. So think of these screenshots as note cards that I get. So as you can see here, for example, almost 70% of my students are first year students. The university for the most part, the university for the most part, the, the University of Indianapolis for the most part is actually we are getting students who are first generation students, okay? Um, the quotes that you see on the right, these are not my quotes, they're the actual quotes from the students. And that also explains about the vast majority of them are actually not psychology students. They are nursing students, they are biology students, they are pre-OT, pre-PT. You see there 32% are retaking the class. What does that mean? is actually they have taken psychology classes in high school. So that get them interested in psychology. So they continue to take psychology while they came to us. Now, the next thing, how confident are my students? And as you can see, I get a 4.2 out of five, which is quite good. And again, you can see from their, from their comments that they feel confident about their ability to take the course. When you read, the, when you read the material inside, and that's the other thing that I like, is that you can actually check each student's response and see what they said. They want, they want to know about psychology. They want to know about how psychology is applied to their life. They want to see how psychology is related to their major and potentially for their future career. Also, how confident they are in terms of learning the material, okay? Now, how much time they're planning to spending outside of class? Um, I have some outliers that they said 10 hours. I don't believe them. So most of them said four hours, which is, I would say, quite accurate. Now, how are they planning to space and pace their learning? And I'm, and I'm, and I'm thinking about that, again, in terms of, of COVID and in terms of, I don't know who the students are. So 
this is again, it gives them different options. And I was happy to see about starting assignments early. Personally, all of the Achieve activities, I have assigned them to be due on Sunday. Um, so to give them essentially time to read the material, apply the material, and they have chosen different ways of preparing for the class. Now, again, I am a qualitative researcher by training. So for me, this is, this is, this is amazing. This is awesome. What are the students are trying to hope to get out of the class? Um, this is one of my favorite responses because I want to learn how this relates to their major. As I mentioned earlier, I have nursing, I have pre-OT, I have pre-PT. So why is this useful? Because it helps me with course planning and the examples that I use, they can reach more students. So for example, if I have nursing students and the chapter that discusses about brain development and brain connections and, and frontal lobes and, and everything like that, I can talk about aphasia, I can talk about stroke, I can talk about traumatic brain injuries, and I can relate that more to their lives. And I think, again, as you can see here, the vast majority of them, it's either a general education requirement or an elective requirement. So for me, having this information informs my teaching, and I find that awesome. Now, how are students planning to optimize environment and mindset? Um, and that goes about, again, in terms of making them conscious about, okay, you want to study, and not just for this class, but these are some of the skills that can be transferred to other classes. Distraction-free study environment, aka, please put your smartphone away, no TikTok videos, no YouTube videos, no Snapchat. So as you can see here, they identified different ways of them trying to figure out, I mean, getting enough sleep daily, we know they don't get enough sleep, right? Now, again, what challenges or obstacles do students have? And I think this is another thing for me in terms of retention, in terms of helping them. And this, again, actual quotes from the students. And when you go to the report, you can see for every student how they responded. International students, um, English, is not their, English is not their first language. And I have student athletes, and I have to take under consideration also their sports schedule. And of course, my heroes, I call them my heroes, and I mean that is just the students who go full time at UND and work full time at UND. I mean, this is not the same time when I was a student that my first job was to study 24 7. These are students that are taking 16, 17, 18 credits and also work. For me, that information is useful, especially when I identify with a particular student, because if something happens, I can follow up with them and see what I can do to help them. What goals they have, thank God they want to get A's. They want to get A's. Um, Graces will be okay with. B's are also an option. And I got one C. Wow. So now the checkpoint survey data. So this was what I got. I gave them, I gave them this first survey the second week of classes. This checkpoint survey one data, this is the follow up that I just gave them at the end of February. And this is what I got. So I also want to show you this is the screenshot of how I have applied the checkpoint survey among all of the other activities. And again, this is one of the things that I love about Achieve myself is just like all the different ways I can engage them from a different activities, not just a quiz, not about reading the book, but actually applying the information. So confidence has gone up. Confidence has gone up from 4.2, 4 it has gone up to 4.5. How do they feel in terms of progressing their goals? Now, I'm happy to see that 0% of them are off track. Now, again, from a qualitative perspective, I like the information that I see here in terms of, okay, can they find time to study? When do they study? It gives them, it puts them in the mindset of, okay, I'm taking 16 credits, I'm taking 17 credits, what do I need to do to stay afloat with all the classes to get good grades? How do I, how can I combine my work, my sports schedule as a student athlete 
also with the, with the school. And at the same time, the metacognition aspect about what strategies you can utilize to get better. How much time, how much time are students spending outside of class? So this one now it has become much more accurate in terms of having three hours, okay? And again, how do the students feel they have grown? So they're not just taking a class, but also how they have grown as people, okay? So how do they space their time? How do they space their learning? Uh, how to, to read the book before they come to class? Um, to better understand the material and of course deal with my accent too, right? Repetition techniques in terms of memorizing the concepts that they are applying to them. And of course, another response, as my second student said, actual response again, how to implement the study skills. Because again, these are the skills that can be applied to, to other classes. For me, again, as I conclude this, um, I'm a psychologist. So for me, it's natural to reach out to my students and see how they are. But I think even for other professions, or if, if you have huge classes, I mean, if there is any way to use this information um, to contact a student center or if they have technology at your university like Starfish to say, hey, flag, this is going on with the student, please follow up. I think for me, that is what I like about Achieve. And also it was very easy to integrate with Brightspace that we use as the LFS at UND. So thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to give the power over to Marcy now and hopefully she has it. Thank you. I think I do have the power now. Um, but Becky, would you mind reassuring me that you can see my slide deck? Yes, which clearly I should have done at the beginning also, but. Oh, <laughs> can't be perfect. And, uh, and so, you know, I actually realized I'm missing a little intro slide here. So I'm gonna ask everybody to briefly ignore this slide. Um, and instead I wanted to take one step back and reflect on a few of the things that Michael has shared with you. So um, as Michael mentioned, he, is, he has been a, a participant in one of our beta studies for the past three semesters. And um, the lovely thing about being a beta participant is you get to um, access some of our content before, while it's still like in what we call innovation phase. Um, and the goal setting reporting survey or goal setting and reflection surveys were indeed in the innovation phase when Michael began using them. And so um, feedback from Michael and his peers has helped us to continue refining them so that they are best serving not only our instructors, but really more importantly, our students, right? Um, when we initially started to conceptualize the goal setting and reflection surveys, it was pre-COVID. Um, and we were responding to feedback primarily from instructors, but also starting to hear inklings from students that um, Courseware does a great job of providing content. So uh, Courseware like Achieve, I can get my content on there. I have my ebook, I have my, um, my adaptive quizzing, I have my assessments, um, but there are some other things that we could use some support with. And we were starting to call them soft skills, right? So they're things like metacognitive strategies that um, historically our students have struggled with, particularly some of our um, underrepresented students. And so if a student like myself is a first generation learner, Oftentimes we were coming into college and we weren't aware of things like time management or planning or setting goals. Um, and so we started to realize that courseware was uniquely positioned to be able to support some of these softer skills in addition to content. Um, as a result, we brought some instructors and students in and we started doing some vision typing and, um, and some solution efforts. And we really honed in on goal setting and reflection because those are two areas that students were uh, struggling with and instructors felt we could uniquely impact. Um, we developed the goal setting and reflection surveys. Initially, we were working with cohorts primarily in STEM. We expanded it to social sciences and then we added in the humanities. Um, and so now here we are three and a half years years later um, and we have this a fully integrated part of our Achieve courses. I think kind of the, the, the um, superstar moment came whenever we realized that with the challenges of COVID, our students were being 
uniquely impacted in in terms not only of getting softer skills that they needed that they may have been able to get if they were on campus and able to go to like a student advising or student tutoring center but also they were feeling like they weren't being seen as a 360 degree person and so an instructor like michael is really valuable because michael recognizes that not only are there covid challenges but our students just have life um, and so our instructors were starting to use the surveys um, as a way to learn more about their students themselves. Um, like for example, if they work full time, uh, if they are only able to access uh, their Achieve program through their mobile device, um, instructors were opening up a whole new world to their students and creating a lot more interactivity with them and as well as awareness of what they, um, what they were experiencing, quite frankly. Um, and so we started incorporating this into all of our beta studies and we started asking instructors to please consider using it. So in our beta studies, you get to choose what you use because every instructor um, makes their own personal choices in their classroom about what's best for their students. But as part of our beta studies, we were now saying, you know, let us highlight this let us introduce this to you please try it out and give us feedback and then in return we're going to get a lot of data on this and be able to determine um, how it may be impacting you and your students some of the things that really started to emerge um, as our instructors received access to the reports that michael shared with you is that number one they're using all parts of the information included in the report so these are direct instructor quotes by the way but i'm pulling on information that resonated the most and that um was was said the most frequently um so when i talk about all parts of the report we talk about things from the students set goals for themselves and so as michael mentioned like a lot of his students said they wanted to be a students some said b but he had one student that said a C, right? So it gives you a little bit of information about the, um, the students who are maybe taking your class because it's their major and they really need to succeed in it, or the students who may be taking it because it's just fulfilling um, a requirement as part of their overall degree. And so they're in there to kind of do what they need to do, but not much more. Um, it's also telling you a lot of information about the resources that your students may have, the time that they may be able to spend um, dedicated to class activities, um, and it talks a lot to the student about how to set goals and more effectively manage their time. Um, it also gives good insight into where students are looking for more. So um, some of the best examples that I can share are, I have some students who have reported to instructors that I'm a highly um, visual learner. And so when I'm sitting and listening to the classroom lecture, that is not sufficient. And so our instructors have been able to go in and assign more things like videos or video activities, because then it's allowing the students to look at something while they are also learning. Um, you know, we also, of course, have our, our auditory uh, students. And so being able to go in and assign more of like the adaptive quizzing or the readings has enabled those students to be better served. It would be hard for an instructor to know this about all of their students if they didn't have these reports. Um, I've even had some instructors who say, you know, I'm kind of going back to my old school methods of adapting my teaching as I get feedback from the students from these reports. So I have students that I'm now tracking as perhaps not performing well and reporting that they recognize that. And so I am assigning some activities and they would maybe go to this cohort of students who are struggling only. Um, and they may be suggestions or they may be assignments. It's up to the instructor, obviously, but they're able to adapt their teaching on the fly so that they can help the students to address the obstacles that they are facing. Um, and so it has enabled more like outcomes driven instruction for our instructors. And it's also enabled them to be more adaptive in the moment rather than you know waiting until say your midterm assessment and then realizing that maybe a third of your class is struggling a little bit and could just use some extra practice um so it's, it's a really um a time a time sensitive piece of feedback we also surveyed our students because obviously they're the ones taking it there is a degree i think of anxiety quite frankly about sharing uh information about yourself with your instructor students want to know that they're being heard um but then as students started to realize they were being heard they started to share more so some of our students are saying um, i'm not only seeing improvement in like say my study skills or my habits for the class where i'm taking these surveys but i can apply it to other classes i mean that is the goal of these surveys it shouldn't be serving just 
one small area of a student's overall college experience. We wanted to serve their entire college experience. Um, the, stu the students report that it's encouraging to them. So sometimes, I, I don't know if you all feel the same way, but sometimes just the art of writing something down and setting a goal for yourself and then setting a calendar by which you'll achieve that goal encourages you, it keeps you on track. Students are saying that this activity, because folks like Michael assign it on an incremental basis, so there's a total of five surveys that are available to you and some instructors just say like, every third week I'm going to assign these, it's a check-in for the students. It causes them to go back and reflect on what they've done and make sure that they improve their habits if they're not, as the next one says, on the right track to get the grade that they desire. Um, we don't have as many students who are coming in, for example, after midterms and saying, I'm failing and now I'm gonna like press the panic button. Um, our students are reflecting earlier and often on what it takes to be successful. Um, and then just overall, it gave them better study habit ideas. And so if our students are getting feedback from the surveys themselves, if they're being pointed to resources by their instructors and then they're seeking out instructor help, you can't help but think it's just gonna start to have an overall positive impact on um, students' overall course performance. So we tested that theory. Um, we did a study and um, it was multiple semesters. And at this point we've had um, a little over a hundred instructors and 3000 students that have participated. Cause of course it's voluntary and we have to get IRB as Be Becky mentioned. Um, and so this represents a multiple semester cohort of instructors and students. And what they found was that when number one, they assigned the goal setting uh, surveys cause you do have to assign them as an instructor. Students who complete them at least two perform two to three percent better on their course grade than their peers who are in the same classes but choosing not to complete the surveys. Um, and then in addition, we compared classes that completed the surveys because they were assigned to classes who didn't. Um, and so what we have found is that generally speaking, even if you just assign one, you're already performing better than your peers who either can't access them or choose not to access them. If you get to a point where you can assign at least three of these surveys, you can perform up to 5% better on your class in your class grade than your peers who choose not to do it. Um, so first and foremost, this is for course grades. This means that these are not assessments that are within the Achieve system and therefore um, more likely to have students succeed if they've been engaging with our content. These are the independent instructor created assessments that contribute to the overall student course grade. Um, second, what we learned is that there is a sweet spot, and that's a lot of what we do in my role. Um, so we want to be able to share information that says where we see maximum outcome with maximum efficiency. And right around three is where you really start to see the maximum gains. We actually, I just want to acknowledge, have this weird trend when you hit four surveys. It could just be the sample that uniquely assigned four, but then we see the rebound at five. Um, so I like what we have. Um, noted is that really anywhere from three to five, you're gonna start to see that nice jump that you would like to see so that you're getting a maximum um, return on your investment of time or your student's investment of time. Um, so important for us to know, it not only helps the student feel heard, it helps their course performance first and foremost, we're also finding that it helps student engagement. And as you guys know, we're still in this wonky world where like some of us are hybrid, some of us are completely async, some of us are completely face-to-face. -face. I think it is gonna continue to shift at least for a few more semesters. I also think async may be here to stay more than it ever has before. So our async instructors in particular talk a lot about like, how do I engage my students? I don't even see my students face-to-face. -face. The only way I interact with them is on email. Um, and what we're finding is that when you do assign the goal setting and reflection surveys, not only do you learn more about your students and you feel like, at least feel like you can serve them better, your students tend to perform better on internal achieve assignments. Frankly, if we didn't, I'd be worried. So I'm self owning that. Um, but things like practice quizzes and homework, the student scores go up as they complete more surveys. And we also see them completing more activities that are assigned in achieve. So in this study, we controlled for all other factors like student um, baseline ability level, which is evidenced by high school grade performance or GPA when we can get it, or their previous GPA, if they have a college previous GPA, they're not first semester freshmen. Um, we control for things like gender and ethnicity and race and um, anything else we can get data on. And what we're finding is that as students complete more of their surveys, they do tend to complete more of their assigned to achieve activities, which for us is a form of behavioral engagement. So I'm not saying that like we are necessarily can make claims about like cognitive engagement or emotional engagement, but at the very least, we know that behaviorally 
quickly, these students are really starting to engage with Achieve activities more frequently as they, um, they start to participate in the goal setting and reflection surveys. Um, and so overall, we're very pleased um, with how this seems to be impacting and influencing our instructors and students. Um, we hope to keep building on it. So as I mentioned, we, um, we prioritize innovation here. We recognize that these are just a few soft metacognitive skills that we should be able to support. So moving forward, we are exploring other types of metacognitive support that we can build in. Um, I would hope that if you choose to start exploring these, you will begin to see them in future semesters, uh, pop up in our innovation lab area, and you might try them out and, um, and decide to chat with me about them. And, um, and you know, that's really the end of the presentation, but I did want to just say I'm very welcome to um, have questions, interact about these. I know that Michael can talk from a practical experience and I can talk from the research side of it. Um, Becky, should I just, will you take the screen back? Should we handle it that way? Uh, you can just, um, you can just stop okay. presenting. Alrighty. And then we'll see if anybody has questions, if somebody has to present to answer questions. Um, so again, if you have any questions, you can put them uh, over on the right hand side in the questions panel and we will see them. Um, we do have a couple of questions on the, on the more practical side already. Um, so uh, Michael, um, Marcy mentioned uh, a few suggestions about when, when some instructors sort of do these surveys. I know you said that you've done one of the checkpoints, but are like you tying that to a, an exam or a time period, or when are you actually releasing? These? I actually mean, so for I use it, do it once per month, um, and I would also say that I actually, for me, they're optional. I give them bonus points, so I don't force the students to talk about them, um, and I give them bonus points as part of positive reinforcement. But no, I mean. Of course, the first one at the beginning, so I can get to know them. Um, and for this semester, I had already missed one day because of Martin Luther King Day, and my class happened to be on a Monday. So one in January, one in February, one in March, one in April, and that gives me enough data about how they are, how they're doing, and who do I need to follow up with if they have any issue, or if they don't have any issue, who are also my staff students, so I can talk to my colleagues about them also. Okay. Um... Marcy, how do you know there is a 5.5% increase in scores? How did you judge this and what data did you use? Yeah, so um, great question. As I mentioned, these are our, uh, the data is from beta studies. And so every semester we partner with around 20 instructors and their students who volunteer to participate in data collection. Um, because we're getting individual student identifiable information, we go through IRB. Um, so for classes, for example, like Michael's class, um, I solicit permission from Michael to invite his first his institution and Michael to invite his students to participate in the study. If they agree to participate, then they complete surveys, which give us some of that anecdotal finding. And then Michael also shares their course performance data with us. Um, once we have their course performance data, we have cohorts like Michael, where some of their students are even within Michael's class, where some of his students, they were given the option to complete these, but they choose not to. We have course performance data from both of those. Um, so we use a statistical model um, Typically, we use hierarchical linear modeling, sometimes structural equation modeling, and we enter in all of the other variables that we know can influence student course performance, and then we isolate the impact of the goal setting and reflection survey so we can talk about differences between students who complete versus those who don't. Um, so, I mean, I, the simple answer is just that we get the course performance data directly from the instructor, so it's true and authentic and not uh, a student, um, you know, like guess at what their final score might be. That was an answer I definitely could not have faked. So nice, nice work. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, Michael, um, everyone, uh, you know, is worried about how much time they have in class. So how much time are these taking either from your class to for the students to do or to review and, and address in class? I The surveys themselves? Yeah. I mean, for the student to take the survey, probably it's there, what, 10 questions, 10, 12 questions. It takes them, what, four minutes, five minutes. Um, and I think if I need to address something, I don't address them with a whole class. I mean, if there is something either good or bad, I'm going to address it individually with a student. Um, if it is something 
urgent, then I would basically get involved with the proper parties at the university. Um, but no, I mean, for me, it's more about getting to know my students, um, invite them to the student hours and come and talk to me um, and see how they're doing, how they're performing and how I can help them. So the, the UIndy, we have around, I want to say 5,500 students. Um, as I said, my classes, I have 45 students, um, different majors. So I don't think, it doesn't matter if they're pre-OT or pre-PT. If there's any way I can help them with this information, and I can make them successful attending UIndy and being here as my student, no matter what's their major, I'm going to do it. So the more information I can get about them, the better. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my approach for mentoring and, and helping our students. Okay. Um, not quite sure. Okay, so I, I'm not quite sure how to answer this, but maybe you can figure out. I think there's a two-part answer. Um, so this is for Michael. Uh, which platform? I. I I, he, this person references the LMS, but I think they also mean the product. Um, okay. Do you use for the surveys or do you just do them on paper? The surveys are through Achieve. The surveys are through Achieve. So basically, when I set up the course, I chose that activity among others. Having said that, Achieve for me, it's integrated through Brightspace, the LMS that we have at UIndy. And the setup, actually, the integration is other LMS. It took me 20 minutes. To integrate it, it was piece of cake. Does that answer the yeah, question? I think okay. so. And and it, and if it doesn't, the person who asked it can come back. Yeah. Because uh, we have a... no papers, no papers. <laughs> We're not doing trees. Yeah, papers. That would be a lot. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we have going back to Marcy's answer. It is most likely that the students who complete them are also the students who are more likely to participate in class in the first place. That means that these students are the one who will naturally do better and complete more assignments. How do you account for this in the data? Yeah, so when we looked at course performance, we actually added in as a covariate the number of assigned activities that the students, sorry, the percentage proportion of assigned activities that students completed um, compared to what was assigned. Um, and so we did try to statistically control for it. I'm owning though that obviously there is some natural um, selection that will occur here students who are more motivated will be more likely to complete these um what was interesting to us is anecdotally in classes like michael's where this was completely voluntary um they just got some bonus points if they decided to complete it um we had students across all ability levels that were willing to um, complete the surveys and so beyond that the best we could do was statistically include the proportion of activities that were completed in our model try to account for that and then report out um, what we found in terms of student engagement and course performance. And Marcy was totally prepared for that question because as we were prepping for this, my oh. husband listened, listened to a video and he was like, I feel like it's just, you know, the do-gooders are doing more. And, I, and she was like, no, 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 that's not the case. So. <laughs> yep. It's a fair question, you know, I mean, and it's it's an ongoing challenge of doing applied research. So, um, you know, students are who they are. We can't control the personalities. We can't randomly assign it. So um, the best option we use is just uh, statistical controls. All right, um, let's see if I see any other um, questions. Oh, one thing I just want to mention. So um, last call, if anybody has any more questions, we will send out um, the recording as well as the slides. So Marcy and Michael, that does mean I need your slides, which I forgot to ask for in advance. Um, we will send out the slides and the recording probably next week. Um, and you should feel free to use this, pass these on to other people um, if you would like any of that good stuff. Um, okay, we had another question. A lot of statistical question. What was your <laughs> Z? What was the number of surveys completed? Uh number of goal setting surveys i'm assuming they mean becky i'm guessing I think, that, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry because i referenced also like the affective surveys um so you could complete anywhere from zero to five um as you can see in this graphic here um i don't have I actually don't remember the mean that was completed. I'm happy to follow up, Becky, um, if you get this person's name and I can yep. reach out directly and report. Mean. Um, and then we can also just have a chat about the statistical model we used if they're interested. Okay. All right. Yeah, because I remember you saying you had about 3,000 students potentially in the overall, but then, yeah, right. if they get between 
zero and five, how many actually? Okay, so, oh, I did answer a question on the statistics. How many students? It was 3,000 students, right? It was um, it was over 3,000. I want it was around 3,600 students. Um, again, I can go back and get um, final numbers. We update this every semester, so we replicate this study um, repeatedly until we move into a quasi-experimental design. This is our fourth semester, um, and so at last count, we had around 3,600. And um, with the reason I'm, I'm faltering is we don't. For some reason, we don't typically report on then the mean number of surveys that were completed across all of the students. Um, but I agree it's important, and we can go back and and easily get that information for you. Okay. All right. Um, any advice for implementation in a larger Gen Ed course? So I think this is a section of like 800 students. Do you? I don't know. Either one of you want to take that. I mean, I think depends if somebody has uh, teaching assistants, um, depends if they have the type of technology, like I mentioned, Starfish, where they can use the data to raise flags, both for the good and for the bad. Um, I think that would be something extremely useful. Now, having said all that, even as a qualitative clinical psychologist and researcher, quantitative data matters. And I think the more data that you have about your students, the better. Um, that's that's my own personal bias. And I think this is one of the main advantages of why I love Achieve so much, because it gives me additional data. It's not just about completing activities, but I also see how students are doing overall. And I get it, 800 students versus 45 night and day, but you still get data. And I think that can make you a better teacher, a better even administrator about, okay, what are your needs and how I can potentially change things, if not this semester, potentially the next semester. So that would be my take. Yeah, and, and Becky, we have the two um, partner instructors that are in the, the current study, um, Molly and Robert, who each have yeah. the they're on 300. They both faithfully administer these. And what they self-report is that, um, first of all, they, they meet with their TAs, like Michael said, uh, regarding the data. Um, when they uh, flag students who specifically report that they fear that they are failing the course or at risk, um, they then isolate those students and they set up one-on-one, -on -one, their TAs set up one-on-one -on -one sessions. And, and so for the person who asked, I know you may not have a lot of TAs, um, they happen to and that's how they use this information. The other thing they do is they, they actually share out some of the aggregate data in the classroom and they use it to talk through strategies for their students. So if, for example, the students um, had, like they had a mass amount of students who had reported that they particularly stud studied, um, struggled with a chapter, they've even gone back and assigned additional optional activities for that chapter and say, kind of just like, I wanna own that a lot of you have said chapter three was very difficult. Um, we are going to offer this because obviously chapter three will be covered you know, in the final. And so they'll assign some additional optional activities. And I would also say, oh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. No, I was I was thinking about even the insight, which we didn't even cover in this presentation about, you can even see how much time they spend on each assignment even. So it's up to you then to decide if you wanna make it more difficult or easier based on the time that they spent for each assignment. So it gives you control. <laughs> Um, and uh, Catherine, the, the people that Marcy is referring to, um, actually Molly did a webinar recently. So I will see if I can um, grab that and send that to you also because she is certainly talking about sort of more of her large class experience. So I will, I will get that to you afterwards. Um, okay, is there content included with these surveys that explains why, why you should set goals, why spacing is good for learning, why mindset matters, that sort of stuff? There's not, unfortunately. It is strictly the survey. Um, moving forward, we have ideas, and I'm just going to throw this out. Like they are really in the conceptualization phase, where we would link resources um, to uh, either research, which I know will lose our students. So we're looking at like, do we write an executive summary that shows like here's the importance of setting goals and how and the applied impact that it may have on you, um, or we're thinking about sharing those resources at the instructor level so that instructors can make decisions about how to best share out with students. We're not there yet. Right now, we've just gotten as far as the surveys themselves and then um, the reporting that Michael shared. 
it's a fantastic idea what what i have done again but from a psych perspective is that we for intro to psych we have that chapter about learning and cognitive approaches so sometimes also i use that to connect with them and show them in the, for example framing right about how do you frame the information how can you use the information about what you learn about yourself to become a better student now but i have the chapter there for me as, as a psych person so for me i can find a natural connection between the two okay um and tracy i actually have a separate webinar <laughs> oddly enough on spacing um that uh, the the professor actually talks about how she explains spacing and why she does it and how she implements it. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's of use, but I will send that to you also as a follow-up. Um, okay. It feels like we're probably at the end of the question. So I will give people a last second um, to write anything else in, but I have a bunch of follow-ups um, and I just want to thank Marcy and Michael for doing this with us today. I think these, I, I love this idea of the surveys. I think, uh, you know, it's a very different approach and you know the building rapport with your students really matters and it really impacts their ability to be successful and so i think anything we can do to help with that is great so thank you both for talking about what you've learned and what you're going to do in the future and learn even more <laughs> we are educators right we are educators so the more we can help our students the better i mean that's that's my take and and as i say as, as corny as it sounds achieve for life achieve for life <laughs> we are not paying for that tattoo if that's what you're going for here no no need no need to send me money no need to send me money <laughs> all right thank you everyone for attending thank you too for presenting and uh we'll be in touch thanks becky bye Michael. thank you bye, -bye. bye, -bye.